there is nothing wrong with your internet, do not attempt to adjust your settings. We are controlling the podcast. We control the squealing and the screams. We can make your heart flutter, your eyes blur from tears, or sharpen your mind to crystal clarity. For the next hour, sit back. We are in control of what you hear. We repeat, there is nothing wrong with your setting. You are about to experience the awe and mystery known as the female mind. You are now entering the Fangirl Zone. Things are only impossible until they are not. Welcome to the Captain's Chair, a Star Trek Picard podcast on the Fangirl Zone. I'm Chief Engineer Steve, and joining me on this mission into the unknown is... I'm Redshirt Dave, and tonight we'll be discussing Episode 7 of Season 1 of Star Trek Picard. Wow, what an episode. I know. There's a lot of things to chew on. Oh, yeah. You just have to decide which one to go on first. There's there's so many. No. I think they they actually took a step back a little bit in the excitement. I mean, the way the last one ended, this one slowed it down like two of us sitting on a dock in the sunshine. Right. Staring across the lake. (laughs) Yeah. To tell you the truth, there's a lot that went on in the background, and we're here to discuss it. Yes, we are. (laughs) Well, (laughs) shall we jump right into it? Sure. So, Episode 7, Nepenthe. Picard and Soji transport to the planet Nepenthe, home to some old and trusted friends. As the rest of the La Siena crew attempt to join them, Picard helps Soji make sense of her recently unlocked memories. Meanwhile, Hugh and Elnor are left on the Borg cube and must face an angered Nerissa. I'll say she is. Yeah. <laughs> she is not I don't know, a I don't happy know how much evil. You know how we're saying how Raffi, Michelle Hurd, is ramping it up? Right. I have to say, Peyton List is, like, trying to hit it out of the park, too. Yes, she uh, is. I, when she appears out of the dark or fog, I'm like, oh, my God, here she comes. Yeah, basically <laughs> out of nowhere. And it was yeah, like, out of whoa, nowhere. hold on. Yeah, they call Picard arrogant? Man. Yeah. Please. (laughs) They don't know what arrogance is. No. All right. Well, we do have some catching up on the past to do as the episode opens with the flashback, finally revealing what happened during that fateful meeting between Dr. Girardi and Commodore O at the Daystrom Institute. Oh, my goodness. So O asked Girardi for her help and basically forced a mind meld with her, showing at his what would yeah, happen sorry, if the synthetic life is allowed to exist <laughs> yeah it, it yeah. was yeah fred in his comments in his feedback for this episode called it a mental rape and oh. i tend to agree <laughs> with him <laughs> oh. well her life changed forever maybe she was violated like yeah. that her whole personality changed she's not the same person at all anymore no and we aren't privy to Any more than just the flashes and images, but it's enough to convince Agnes to turn against everything she's worked toward her entire life. And there's a few important points here. First, what is it that Commodore O actually shows Girardi? Is it a. And was it the truth? Right. Is it a theoretical future? A worst case scenario of what could happen if synthetic life were allowed to flourish? Or is it we had discussed prior to turning the recording on that back when Spock died, he basically did this remember mind meld to McCoy. Right. Could yeah, so have... You can insert some type of command or right. narrative or train of thought if you want. If Spock can tell McCoy, remember, so they can find him in the next movie. Right. <laughs> Why can't Commodore O do the same thing exactly. with Agnes? Yeah. I still have sympathy for Agnes's character, but I'm not sure why should we trust O at all. We already know she's a traitor. She's a Vulcan working with the Romulans. Right. So who's to say she didn't come up with this narrative or belief system that maybe she believes, but it's not really based in reality. I started thinking of death cults and other things and seeing her with that. One of those flashing images was her in a hood, in a right. circle of people. And it was like, what is this? Is she a witch (laughs) (laughs) or something? Yeah. Or what is it? And if you're in a cult or something like that, you believe what you want to believe. And if she imparted that to Agnes, then then Agnes believes it too, even though it may not be the truth. Right. Absolutely. And yeah, she could be part of the um, purest group on Vulcan that didn't want anything to do with anybody. And maybe if they now discovered 
what the Josh Vought was scared of, or if they actually may have even been behind the creation of organic synthetic yeah. Romulans, then yeah, my but theory they don't is, want yeah. that to get out. My theory was that the uh, Romulans are hiding something, that they're a race of synths that only a small minority of them know that when they left Vulcan. Right. They all died out except for the synthetic ones left to life in the long lost technology. I wonder if there was something that preceded that now that the Vulcans are hiding. What are the Vulcans hiding? Did they send a race of people out into space that are actually synths and it's their deepest secret? Right. It's, Boom. My yeah. head just exploded. <laughs> sure could be. Man, that and would it, be an see, awesome twist if this is actually the Oh, Vulcans. my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, the possessors of logic and truth. Because I'm wondering, this is something else we discussed before we went on air. What is the logic in being a traitor? Commodore, oh, she's a Vulcan. She's working with the Romulans, hand in glove. She must be doing this because she logically assumed or thought this is the right path to take. Right. So that's what made me think, well, it must be the Vulcans are hiding something and not the Romulans. But the Romulans are partners in it. And that's what the Jat Foster all about is keeping this dread secret. Because when they started flashing images, of what O put into Gerardi's head. There was a lot of wild stuff. Oh, there was yeah. There's explosions. And... There's planets cracking. Yep. There was someone who seemed to be pulling their face apart with their fingers. And I thought that, well, maybe that's a synth. Maybe it's a synth. They have enough strength to destroy themselves, I don't know, physically. Right. Or whatever. But why? Or it's just a vision. Uh, we were teased by the teaser at the end of the episode about something that would drive you insane. It's like, <laughs> teases are notoriously unreliable right <laughs> it looks like one thing but it totally means something else but i couldn't help but think like is that someone going with insane with the knowledge of that they're really a synth i mean that didn't happen with zoji no i mean she's upset right and didn't she's not die her face apart. Either, so yeah it's a lot to chew on and we're just getting started but that could be very profound as we move along yep so wow what a way to start the episode. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Not much happening here. Move along. Right, yeah. And we still got the possibility of some kind of time travel or message from the future or something. So who knows? Oh, well, we know there's a Star Trek crew 900 years in the future now. That's right. And maybe they <laughs> get a message back and they're the ones that started all this. Oh, man. Let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, shall we check in with the La Serena, Dave? Sure, why not? <laughs> it's very peaceful up there on that ship. <laughs> well, except for okay. one emotional Girardi. <laughs> oh, man. Guilt does horrible things to people. Yeah. So, when we get to La Serena, the ship is stuck in a tractor beam, which is my favorite color tractor beam, green. Yes. Red, that's okay. Green, much better. Yeah. <laughs> And they have to be left, really, almost dry docked or uh, be calmed or whatever the sailing term you want to use, because Jean-Luc and Soji are gone. Right. And anticipating this and holding them there, Narek is climbing aboard a little ship. And I thought it was interesting they call it a snakehead. Right. Learned that a little later in the episode. But how do you kill a snake, Steve? Yeah, cut its head off. Right. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. We'll see how that comes into play, too. Right. So... Rios figures it out. I was a little disappointed with Rios in this episode. His stock, I mean, I still like him. He's got good soccer skills or football <laughs> skills. But uh, come on, dude. He was a little slow to pick up on things. Anyway, he figures out he's being followed by Narek. That's how you get, you, when you let someone go, it's because they want you to go. Right. Somebody I, is following you. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> you know, Rappi's one of the first things she said. Well, they let us go. And uh, I think uh, Agnes pretty much concurred with that, too. Right. Of course, she was begging. Let's just tell them we want to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. She did not look good in this. No. And kind of plays into her panic. She says, why don't we just go home? Why do we, what do we want to go to this planet for? And Rafi turns around and looks at her like, what? Yeah. Are you kidding? I want to go home. Like an else find, and then she drops an F bomb about a synth. Right. And why does it have to be me? It's because because you're guilty. Yeah. Because you're guilty. And, <laughs> yeah. And you could tell that as soon as she blew up that way, Rafi was yeah. on top of it. She knew there was something going on. Yeah. Her her gears started turning, but of course, Agnes playing her cards correctly in the previous episode slept with the captain. Right. So naturally. He sympathized with her. I mean, well played, Agnes, or whoever coached her, of course. Rafi smells something. You can say, I mean, she's, Michelle, her's got that terrific 
use of her face there. It's just some uh, a subtle look like, what? Yeah. <laughs> she didn't have to say anything. Let's go get some cake. Yeah. Now, but I it, wonder the if there was yeah. anything in that cake. <laughs> Yeah, they made her throw up, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> Lousing replicant frosting. Yeah. It's just red velvet. And she picks it out. Ah, don't worry. It's just red velvet, Rios. Yeah. Big baby. When Rios goes down there, he thinks it's Rafi that's being tracked. Why would he think that? Because she disappeared to visit her son? No. That was definitely those two know each other so well that they both picked up on the same thing and they were both playing her trying okay. to get her to yeah. admit to what she did that was my other thought too that he was ju- he was just trying to get her to spill yeah what he was rafi's rotten hell yeah she is you liar <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i think she was about to blurt it out she looked so upset i thought her face was gonna crack in two yeah yeah she was just about to break and then yeah. of course Narek shows up again yeah because, well, as the viewing audience, we know what's really going on here. So he, he runs back up to the bridge. And so Gerardi goes to a replicator and picks up a, a handheld device and injects herself in the neck. And it said it could have, what, neurological or neurotic effect? And, of course, it did. But well, that was the yeah. warning from the replicator. And her mouth started foaming, and she went into a, a seizure, which put her in a coma. Right. So my question is, when she chewed that tablet, that Commodore O gave her earlier, you have to chew it. Right. So that genetically enhanced her or changed her somehow. And so when you put yourself in a coma, that counteracts it because that, I don't know, your electrical impulses through your brain are different. Right. So it doesn't work anymore. That's kind of what I'm thinking, yeah, is that she knew that by doing this, she would be able to turn off the tracking device. Well, O said to her in the when you're catching up on the episode just before the real episode starts, it's going to require a great sacrifice. Right? Did she mean that Agnes would eventually have to sacrifice herself out of guilt? Did she did O anticipate that? Do you think, or she was just talking about turning on your friends? It would not surprise me if O actually meant that she probably would have to sacrifice herself. Because when she first did it, that was the first thing that I thought was, oh, she's trying to kill herself. Yeah. Hopefully she's smart enough to know it had just put, I mean, it's a, it's a roll of the dice. You can either survive it or you don't. Right. But she was so racked with guilt, I think she preferred to be in a coma. And hopefully the coma acts as a shutdown of her system. And once you chew that thing, it doesn't work anymore. There's no more neurons firing in the same way that they used to. So the tracker doesn't work, I'm assuming. Yeah. That has to be the assumption because shortly thereafter, we see Narek all upset because he's lost yeah. the signal. He swore in Romulan. Yeah. I had to write that down. <laughs> oh, I'm writing that down. I'll say that at work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll go see what's happening on the reclamation cube as Narissa demands that Hugh give up Picard and Soji's destination. She's so dark. Oh, yeah. And of course, she's got. What, about five or six XBs standing there, and she's going to execute them all if you won't tell her. And yeah. she keeps her word. I wonder, she said uh, that the treaty is keeping them alive. Right. I wonder if that was a ruse also. I mean, she what does she care? She doesn't care. She's in her home field, her home stadium. You know, right. well, yeah, that, I think she just played that card. Right, to, to see alive. if she so, could get more information out of him. Yeah, right. I agree. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that treaty wouldn't have. I know. It wasn't worth care? the paper it was written on as far as yeah, Maris is I concerned. Know. Star Trek parchment. Yeah. Now, of course, Hugh runs into Elnor and tells him that he's now going to lead an open revolt against the Romulans and seize control of the artifact. And uh, Elnor is all in for that. Yep. And I want him on my side too, but of course, somebody's been listening. Yeah. She gets, she, she gets to walk out of the darkness with a fog machine going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. She is killing it. Peyton List is killing it. Yes, she is. Seen her in several shows, and she's done a fantastic job in all of them, but none of them were this type of character. So, yeah, to she, see her she really. She plays something very sweet. Yes. To see her be able to play evil this well is. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, say, like, damn girl, where you been? <laughs> yeah. Of course, Elnor dispatches Rizzo's guards and directly engages her in combat. Now, of course, she mentions the Kualat Malat. Yep. 
So she and knows she's... what he's capable of. She doesn't understand why he's a male, but she knows what she's in for. And she actually puts her phaser away. And she admits that she's Jat Bosch. Yes. You know, you against me. Yeah. Well, I'm a lot and shot Bosch. Let's let's bring it. Yeah. And hand to hand. Yeah. No swords, no phasers, disruptors, nothing. Hand to hand. And of daggers. course, <laughs> Elnor falls for it. And Rizzo uses the dagger and throws it at Hugh, hitting him in the neck. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. I know. That was too bad. Great throw by her. Actually, I thought uh, when Elmore grabbed it and to throw it back at her, it's like a sweet move. Right. You know, the guy's going to die. You know he's going to die, but I'm going to use your weapon against it. But she had already hit the uh, transport button. Right. Yeah. And she knew what to expect. That's for sure. Yeah. Good fighter. Yeah. It was a great fight scene between them. There is no doubt about that. That was. Do you sense a rematch? Oh, yeah. I hope so. I hope. Yeah. I, I think so. <laughs> I think we yeah. will get a rematch before the season is over with. Hopefully it'll be a little uh, good to bad and ugly music in the background. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they face off some long cube hallway. Right. Fingers twitching. <laughs> or maybe uh, Seven will get involved and they'll get a tag teamer. <laughs> yeah, when eventually when things are going bad, I mean, Hugh dies and Helnor's on the run and he finds the... What are we calling it? It's like a dog tag or a help, help me device. Yeah, the yeah, SOS the, square. <laughs> yeah. To get the uh, Fenris Rangers like, yes, because yeah, everyone wants to see Seven of Nine again. Yes, please bring her into this. Yes. And at first when I saw it, I said, that's what Seven gave Picard. Yeah, so how'd it but get how there? But how did it get there? <laughs> I don't know. There have been another... Did Picard give it to Hugh and Hugh leave it behind? I don't see it, but no. it's possible. I guess it is. Was yeah. it just randomly dropped by Picard in all the action? And, and Elnor finds it on a board cube in the dark, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I couldn't come up with any reason why Picard could have lost it on the cube. Because well, I don't think he would have taken it on the cube. Yeah. Unless these things are sprinkled on the cube a long time ago. You mean even when it was just sitting there? Maybe there was some action aboard that cube after it was abandoned by the collective. Right. That the rangers identified, and they just, like, sprinkled them about there in case any of them needed help as they, uh, you know, like cookie crumbs. Sure. They in investigated the cube and decided it was out of Problems. action. Maybe. Maybe that was it. Yep. That's a good one. Yeah. Or... One of the rangers actually was involved in the the last ship that the Borg took with the Romulans on them. Like they were assimilated too? Yeah. Maybe. Let's hope not. <laughs> I like <laughs> yeah. your idea better that, yeah, the, the rangers found the cube after it had been deactivated and left their little... Yeah. Um, calling cards. Calling cards for in case mm. something happened while they were checking it out. Yeah. Break class in case of emergency. Yes. I like that. Yep. Me too. Okay, let's so, move on. You want to go to a happy place, Steve? Oh, yes, let's go to a happy a place. pizza. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's go to Nepenthe. So, Picard and Soji are greeted by a young girl wearing an animal ear decorated cloak and wielding a bow and arrow. And being a boomer, <laughs> <laughs> what was that famous book that we studied way back as kids, Lord of the Flies? Yes. Where the kids dress as so they're left on an island all by themselves. And they start getting into, I mean, they go tribal. Yes, go very tribal. tribal. Spears, bows yep. and arrows, <laughs> killing each other. Spoiler alert. This particular appearance by Kester, as we learn her name, it just it reminds us so many things. I mean, the first thing I thought of was Lord of the Flies for everyone who read that. But it suggests sort of like elves in the woods. Right. You know, a little lost Lord of the Rings boy is it? Lost boy-ish? Yep. Lost boy-ish. Yep. So there's, there's a lot of things that that uh, could have gained inspiration from so that little girl talk which is awesome and but were picard. you surprised when she knew picard i guess uh, we shouldn't no. have but it kind of went i had to double take for a second i was like, okay how no, do you i wasn't saying sure she knew or thought she knew i wasn't i really i to tell you the truth i wasn't sure she knew it was really him or not i don't know why she should know because his picture is in her brother's bedroom yes. bedroom that but it's preserved there, so she should know. Right. I mean, she didn't diss him. I mean, everyone else gives him a hard time. Like, dude, you got old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they separate themselves from Picard. He walks, and then Kestra and Soji walk together. And Kestra shows her a compass and tells her it's broken, but admits uh, 
her arrows are real, but she's a pacifist and she's not going to use them. <laughs> and it really was a cute little conversation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It gives Soji a chance to smile, break all the tension and, and laugh at this little girl's games and fun. Right. Until she happens to find out about who Soji's father is. Yeah. And like a little girl, he yells out, you're an android. OMG. Like, yeah, oh. That's so and cool. Kind of, and it's like, uh, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Picard tries to <laughs> calm her down. You never know which one you're going to get. Right. Mr. Sensitive or Mr. Dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mr. Dumb comes up later. But right, right. now he's great. He's, he did the same thing with Dosh. Right. He says, I don't care what your name is. I know what kind of, I know you're in trouble and I can help you. Right. Yeah, but it's difficult for Soji to swallow. How many times? I mean, she just came up the biggest betrayal of her short three-year life. Yes, and you can't blame her. No. Apparently, she didn't get the same programming that Dodge got to seek out Picard. Yeah, I wonder why not. A different mission, I suppose. Right, and I guess they never figured that Picard would make it out to the reclamation cube. But even so, every time Dodge contacted her mother, her mother would say, find Picard. Right. And that this just didn't exist at all in the conversation with uh, Soji. No, whenever she calls her mom, she goes to sleep. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and if you're downloading information, wouldn't that be a good time to pack in some Picard information just in case? Yeah, you'd think. Guess not. Yeah. Maybe it'd be too dangerous for her. Right. Aboard the cube. Better off knowing what you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> And, of course, Card telling Soji that Daj was murdered didn't help either. Yeah, he didn't, he's just not much for sugarcoating it, is he? No, that would have been something that I would have waited in probably a few more days. <laughs> I know, at least after a pizza. <laughs> yeah, to break that information to her, but yeah, you know, it's typical, Picard. Typical, he, uh, he thinks that's something that she needs to know. Typical Picard arrogance. Yes. <laughs> So we make it to the house of Riker. And hey. Card receives a giant hug from Kestra's mom, Commander Deanna Troy, who instantly senses that he's in trouble. Yep, can't hide that. Nope. And Picard goes inside and receives a similar embrace from William T. Riker, who immediately recognizes that Picard needs a place to hide out. Yeah. You know, first of all, before we, we move on yes, this... to what goes on, it, it was so genuine. The hugs, I don't know how many times they re rehearsed that or did it, but it was like the excitement from William Riker especially. I mean, there was the love from Dan or Troy, but the yes. excitement from Riker when he gets the giant bear hug. Yes. You know, it was, it was so, as a fan, that's so fulfilling. Absolutely. And all through Next Generation, you never really got to see – the height yeah, difference between Jonathan yeah, and yeah. Uh, Pat. You can see Riker climb you over could. the chair plenty of times, but he's not hugging the boss. Yeah, you could see that he's quite a bit taller than Sir Patrick yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> so that I, uh, was awesome as well. It was. I was going to make a joke with you that when Riker was over, he was grating the cheese. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, hey, Steve. Did you notice that cheese was like a cube, like a boar <laughs> cube that he was grating? Yeah. <laughs> that means the poor cube, like this cheese, is going to be destroyed. Yep. Kidding. <laughs> of course. Oh, when... I'll put it on Twitter tomorrow, the great cheese cube theory. <laughs> yeah. So when Picard suggests not only raising the resident's shields and activating its perimeter scans, but also running anti-cloaking scans, Riker realizes that Picard's problems involve the Romulans. Yeah, of course he's got they a little do. bit of the Sherlock Holmes in him, too. Oh, yes, he does. Now, of course, he basically tells Riker that his plan is falling apart, he's lost his crew, and Soji's in danger. And <laughs> Riker mm -hmm. says, sounds like you need a new plan. Yeah, I thought he was going to come up with one, too. Yeah. I thought they were actually going to get out a tablet or one of those holographic things and come up with a new plan yeah kind of thought i so know you too. went there for solace and to hide out and for protection but i actually thought they were going to knock heads and come up with a plan yeah. but it, it never uh, developed nope and so jl gets a little bit of a nap mm -hmm. as riker continues making homemade tomato and basil pizzas and we get a little moment with kestra and soji as she tells soji about data 
And she surmises that the reason Soji has mucus, blood, and saliva is that Data always wanted to be human, having dreams, telling jokes, learning how to ballroom dance. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's something more to that. I do too, um, yeah. We've discussed the purloined letter from Medgar Allan Poe a few times on our episodes now, and how do you hide something? You hide a letter with all the other letters, so you can't feed it. It's, it's hiding in plain sight. Right. I wonder if uh Bruce Maddox or whatever was imparted from data to Bruce Maddox was if you want to hide something like Soji or Dodge, you make them like everybody else. Right. That's why you have tears and, and mucus and everything else. So you're just as human as everyone else and they're organic synthetics. And if they have all that, they're the same as everyone else. I think that's a clue to the future. I think they were trying to drop something for us right there. Okay. Just pretty subtly. Right. I mean, they keep going on with mucus and blood and saliva. It's like, okay, yeah, we know that. And she's different. She's organic. But I wonder if that includes the ultimate fate of either season one or season two. I don't know. But I think we should keep an eye on that. Hopefully it has something like the theme of the purloined letter where everything is in plain sight. I don't know if that's a good thing for the future or a bad thing. We right. just need to know yes. more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that may tie back to O. Yeah. And they're either real or fake vision that she imparted. Yeah. To Soji. If you're a listener and, of course, us, I would keep that together, those two trains of thought together and see how it plays out. Yep. So let's uh, discuss a little bit while Riker knows. So Troy shows Picard the, the bedroom of her and Riker's late son, Thad. And it would have been his 18th birthday a week ago, which is sad. Yes. Uh, poor thing. Troy tells Picard to stay as long as he likes, but she acknowledges, I'm not as brave as I used to be. And Jean Luc responds, Well, you're getting wiser. She pretty much tears up, too, more tears and mucus. Right. We also see that the Rikers are having to deal with the death of a son. And they don't want to lose a daughter. And they don't want to lose a daughter. So it's, it's like a tough message. everybody will stay all right. Yeah, everybody, stay as long as you want, but not too long. Right. Yeah. We can't <laughs> afford to have the thought brought here. Yeah. Because we can't yeah. lose anybody else. What did he call her? A woman of the wild? Yes. Something like that? I don't want to lose her. She was good, though. Good little actress. Oh, yeah. So Riker gets in a shot, because everyone gets in a shot at Picard in this oh, series. Oh, yes. But it's not See? out of malice. It's out of love. Yeah, that's right. And it's amazing to be able to see both of them be able to be so honest yeah, with John Luke. Be. And that's yeah. really yeah. what he needed. Yeah. I tell you, Steve, I still don't agree with the uh, Riker slams Picard for his classic arrogance. I'm like, if he's the captain, and then that's that's the end all. Captain of the ship makes all the decisions. If you're an animal, you're a captain of many ships. Right. So to tell him this is typical Picard arrogance, I'm like, hey, that's the way it goes. You know, if you're the <laughs> captain, the, the buck ends with you. It's not right. arrogance. It's his job. Don't you agree on that? I'm like, I said that. I'm like, what? That's not arrogant. That's being a captain. And if he wasn't a captain and he was being a jerk, that's arrogance. Right. <laughs> but all those years they were together, I mean, he didn't know him. Well, after the uh, the Romulan disaster and everything else, I mean, they went their separate ways. Riker went to Titan, you know, had right. a family and everything else. And, and John Luke went into seclusion. So how does he know if he's arrogant? When he knew him, he was captain and admiral. So that goes with the job. Right. right but up, at this point up. in time, he's really not the captain anymore. Yeah, not anymore, but how can you say classic arrogance when classic means back in the day, and back in the day he was captain? Yeah, <laughs> true. That's not, that's not arrogant, that's, being, that's his job. Yeah, true. Maybe he just always wanted to say that to him. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Finally got it off his chest yep. 15 years later. <laughs> anyway, Picard takes it on the chin again, and he admits he may not be up to the challenge, and he learns that he have to attain baby steps in order to achieve humility. I don't totally agree with that. I can jump off my soapbox now. You're not arrogant <laughs> when you're captain or admiral. Right. You're the boss. Yeah, but it was really great when Riker basically says, well, you want to tell me what's going on? No? Yeah. Okay, well, let me tell you what's going on. <laughs> yeah, he deduced everything, too. It really is kind of obvious. I yes. know sometimes... I guess if with the arrogance is you can't see the forest for the trees. So Picard says, as long as I keep mum, no one will figure it out. And then Riker just spells it out for him. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> but Picard comes back with, not bad for a pizza chef. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they can both jab each other and it's all in good fun. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, we see Soji and Kestra becoming fast friends, speaking to each other in a language called Vivine that Thad created. That could come in handy someday. It, it could. You know what it made me think of? It made me think of the old Navajo code talkers in World War II. Yep. Everybody can monitor somebody else's communications, even over walkie-talkie back in the day, just find the right frequency. So the American forces had Navajo speak their language to each other, and they would just relate whatever was going on at the front to their commanders, but the Japanese could not figure out Navajo at all. So I'm wondering if Vivine will come into play the same way, that uh, now that we're going to come to find out that Soji picks it up because she reads Thad's book and get a grip on it, I wonder if she'll use that language to pass on knowledge to them, and the Romulans will have no clue right. what she's saying. I certainly hope so, because I yeah. think that would be awesome to see that. It would be. And Troy gets Soji to try a real tomato. That was great. It's the first food she's ever eaten that didn't come from a replicator. And it squirted on her. Yeah. <laughs> Bites into it and it squirts like, what was that? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> and Troy tells Soji about Thad and Thad's mm -hmm. desire for a home, which is what Nepenthe eventually became for him. Because when he was born, they were on the Titan. And that's mm -hmm. why he came up with the... Vivine language was he had imagined what his home world would be like. Yeah, that's touching. Very. But we also find out that Thad died of a rare disease that could have been cured if not for the synthetic band. Yeah, they could have used access to the an active positronic matrix because of the band. They couldn't get it. Right. And that makes his death even more sadder. Yeah. And um, we can see that's mirrored in today's society, too. I mean, there's people are trying to find cures to MS. And a lot of the time it's blocked politically because there's a no, nope, no, that's you're messing around with life. Right. You can't splice people's genes. That doesn't make them less human. So it can't be done. And then people die. Yeah. And according to Troy, real isn't always better. But of course, Soji is still intensely skeptical, suspecting that this Paradise and its kind inhabitants are all part of an elaborate trap. Hmm. Can't blame her. Now, Picard comes up and tells her he understands her doubts, but once again, probably not the right thing to say. <laughs> and she basically shoves him aside and storms off. Yeah. Well, she didn't break him in two, but she could have. Right. And yeah. I Troy... like the Rikers. Rikers is like, hey, hey. Yeah. <laughs> He's an old man. Be gentle with him. Yeah. Like me. <laughs> yeah. Now, of course, Troy chastises Picard for not fully comprehending how shaken Soji has been by Narek's subdiffuse and attempt on her life. There was something, I don't know if it was during the dinner or the private conversation, but... Troy said there was a flaw in her programming, and that's what led to the, her emotional, her doubt and mistrust. Right. And, and I'm like, it's funny that Troy would see it that way, because Troy can't read her. Right, at know? all. And she says, well, it's a flaw in her programming. It's not a flaw. No. It's on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> I hope the writers realize that, because that wasn't deliberate. That's on purpose. The same yeah. thing is, is introducing her to the dream world. Yep. And giving her mucus and tears. Not a flaw, it's real. So you'll figure it out, Troy. Just be patient. Yeah. Trust your daughter. <laughs> yeah. So how about a little dinner, Steve? All right. With the Rikers. Yes. <laughs> with pizza. The yeah, best. with pizza. Pizza's in the future, thank goodness. Yes, absolutely. I so, probably uh, had a little bit more meat, but eh, maybe not. Bunny, <laughs> sausage. There's, there's always so many that still burns part of it, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cancel the red alert. So Soji recounts Narek's meditation, the, the ritual of ruse, and Kestra, with the aid of Captain Rupert Crandall, who also lives on Nepenthe, discovers the location of Shoji's homeworld, which doesn't have a name but has a number, and Steve, I figured it out. Okay. Want to know what planet it is? It's what? Planet Jenny. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You know what the number is? 8675309. No. <laughs> <laughs> They're on Planet Jenny. <laughs> uh, I don't know whoever else got that, but I got it. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> 8675309. I got it. <laughs> Same one more time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So you, you all can, I mean, there's somebody, I know there's plenty of listeners out there to get that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the rest of you have to go look up Jenny, 8675309. <laughs> and don't forget to sing it to yourself. That's right. <laughs> on, on YouTube. So Picard works hard to convince Soji that he can trust him, admitting that he wants to help her because he's the daughter of a dear friend, Data. Finally, he's finding his lighter side. Picard. Hey. First, he's going to get his ass kicked by her. Now he's like, maybe I should take this a little slower. Right. Be a little more fatherly here. Yeah. It helps to be a little introspective, too. He he admits he was just wasting his life. Right. You know, and now he's alive with it all. And he has a mission. And there's not a, a hell of a chance that you or anyone else can stop him. <laughs> well, when you're the captain, that's not arrogance. It's your job. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> But one of my favorite scenes was the next morning when Picard and Riker take a break and they're they get this forest nestled lake, which is pretty awesome. Oh yeah. And, and it had this really interesting mountain range. And there's that I'll just go off on a tangent because that's what I do. Yeah. In in the background of the mountain, it looks like there's a handle on the mountain range. There's like I don't know, it's a rock extends to another one, as if it's a handle, like God's handle. If he right. wanted to pick up or a kettle wait, right. if you wanted to pick up this planet. He would grab it by the handle. But it also reminded me of the portal projector right? that they use and the city on the edge of forever. And they actually return that at the end of it when they gaze up. I mean, the camera moves up. You get a, cl- a closer look at the, we'll call it the handle right. on the mountain range. And it goes up and there's three moons Yeah, overhead. I don't know what that means. D- did you have any thoughts on that at all, Steve? <laughs> no, I, I thought it was awesome. And I, I noticed. I did think it was very curious that that mountain could have that rock just kind of go around like that. And I was like, yeah. wow, I wonder how that actually happened. Uh, uh, and you'd think with three moons that close that they'd, they'd be having an earthquake every, I don't know, yeah, 30 minutes? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, Tidal back, it must be incredible there. Yeah, we'd be seeing waves on that beautiful little lake they yeah, were on. Yeah, <laughs> sloshing all over the place. Yeah. I wonder, like I said earlier, that cheese that uh, Riker was grading. It looked like a cube, a boar cube, <laughs> <laughs> or the handle up in the mountain range. Looks like God's handle, or it's neither. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it, is but a it was fun. Scene. Yes. Yeah, there's probably nothing to it. But he did say, <laughs> he was talking about the crew that they're decidedly <laughs> motley, and they seem to get carrying more baggage than they ever did. Yes. Like, yeah, baggage, like a baggage handle, like on that mountain, I get it. <laughs> I'm kidding, kidding. There is something strange that did happen in that conversation. They got into retirement and how Picard re- retired. And Riker said that he, he always thought he, Picard never had any business retiring, to which right. Picard replies, and you were right. Like, hold it. That yeah. was just a, a play. He was just throwing a card down on the table yeah, as a ploy to get him what he always got in the past, his way. There's no way Riker could have known any of that. That was just a spur of the moment thing that he lost at. I'm not sure what uh, Riker's, he, I guess he doesn't know the whole story. Maybe he doesn't know that no, Picard I, was playing, you know, he's yeah. just thinking, oh, I want to retire. I'm like, I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was trying to give him an ultimatum. and they Called they my bluff. Yeah, my <laughs> bluff and I'm screwed. Yeah. Then he says, uh, thanks for not talking me out of this. And Riker says he knows better. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and even though he called him arrogant earlier, he said that that was always a losing proposition trying to get him into a, well, especially if he's your captain, you know, yeah. you can argue with him. <laughs> so that's that's going to continue to rub me the wrong way. He's not arrogant. He's the captain. Yep. And so we get to the goodbyes where we see Kestra conveys to Soji that she understands what it's like to experience something really awful. Her brother's death that still haunts her. And that what helped her get through it were her parents. And maybe you need a father figure. And you have Picard. Yeah. Didn't right too, there. Take too long to put that math together, did it? No. But at least Soji replies that she'll think about it. Yeah. So we'll see. Now, we see Kestra giving Soji the compass as a gift, and they say their farewells and beam back to the La Serena. Yeah. So it was a nice ending, and it was a good little metaphor for finding your own way. Even though that thing doesn't work, you can find your own way if you just learn to trust people. Right. If you can, I mean. She had the worst experience. You know, she's going to have to learn how to read it, though. Yes. You know, she didn't know. She wasn't human before, but now she's going to have to read people in a different way. Yes. That's, that will, that'll be interesting. Right. Especially being on the La Serena with that crew. <laughs> I know. 
are we going to have to worry about Girardi coming out of her coma and trying to kill Soji? Yeah, she'll foam all over her. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's... I wonder how that's going to come out. I mean, it's got to come out. Yes, especially you know? with the EMH showing up. Yeah, I know. He's got to be was taken he care of. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Rappy goes, hello. Yeah. What was he doing? Taking a break or is he playing cards with his compatriots on a holiday someplace? <laughs> yeah. Now, that wouldn't surprise me. Well, that'd be awesome. I want to see that scene. I hope it's on the cutting room floor somewhere. Yes. That would be <laughs> great to see four or five of them sitting there playing poker together. <laughs> I know. All with different accents. <laughs> yeah. The Irishman, the Scottishman, the Englishman, the, the Spanishman, yeah. the American. That'd that be hilarious. would definitely rival uh, orphan black scenes. That's for sure. Wow, yeah. If, if they can do that, they can do this. Yeah. So that's pretty much how it ended with that little metaphor of finding a way and finding family. And we know what kind of dad Picard makes, lousy one. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> it right happen, <laughs> they, have, they have to learn from each other. Yeah. So we got a few things to discuss at the end. Like how did that ranger square end up on the board cube? Right. Yeah, that still got... I think we've come up with the most plausible reason mm. for it, but... It's awful. Uh, Hopefully, they curious. were sprinkled on. There. Right, well, maybe like they scouted it out before it was discovered by the Romulans, and they just left it as a a floating hulk in space. And uh, as they went around searching for trouble, they left uh, squares behind in case they got in trouble. Right, I think. Yeah. And did you know that the names of both of the Troy Riker children and anybody who sharp eyed noticed on the desk in Thad's room that his name was Thaddeus Troy Riker? He's a hyphenated child. Yeah. I looked like some type of bowling trophy or something. I couldn't quite catch it, but it was on a plaque. Right. When I was a kid and we were bowling, everybody got a trophy. <laughs> that was before it became a thing, too. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thaddeus Riker, slightly different spelling, was an ancestor of Will Riker who fought in the American Civil War. And it was saved by Q. And uh, you could go down a real rabbit hole. Oh, yes, you can. <laughs> to get there, but it was worth it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they did a lot of research on this show. They picked out just about everything everywhere and all sorts of you, you drive yourself mad trying to pick up on every easter egg in here but yes. kestra is named after deanna troy's late older sister who died when troy was an infant and that was recounted in the star trek's next generation season seven episode the dark page so these guys don't forget any there's no stone unturned no it's like the writer's room have got volumes and volumes of scripts in bookcases yeah. and spend hours just flipping through them <laughs> Oh, we can use it has, that. It, it has a real personal touch, too, that, that like, Data's memories lives on. Yes. Through his friends and their children. Because the theme of children in the show is super heavy. Yes. You know, with your children, you survive your children, and children survive you. It's a, It could be, like, a 50-50 toss-up. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And did you ever see the movie uh, Forbidden Planet? It was made in the 50s, and uh, Walter Pidgeon was a star. He didn't know that his mind was... Uh, working the machines on the planet. Okay. They had, they had a planet without tools. He did, it was absolutely tool-less. All you had to do was think of something, and a machine, the planet was a machine. It could make it for you. Right. And whenever there was trouble, he would put his hand over, like, glowing cube, or he would tell Robbie the robot, and all these lead shields, whatever, would slam down around the house, and it would go bang, 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 bang. And I thought that was cool because Riker's and Troy's house, all they had to do was talk to the computer and things would just glow a little bit here and there. And they yes. clanking or bang. Yeah. And how cool was it that Riker's house was completely tricked out with shields and everything? Yeah. He, That's a long, long enemy. cabin yeah. I want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a long list of enemies, too. Yeah. I was going to say, we've discussed all sorts of things here. The Lost Children. Uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe we're going to look into some Navajo code talking with the Vaveen. The logic of being a traitor. Is it a death cult? Are the Vulcans hiding something and right. not them? Man, and I, I like the part about hiding in plain sight with mucus like a human. But I, I wonder if there's one more thing we might see at the end. And I was thinking the end of the first season of Discovery. Right. All of a sudden, the Enterprise just pops up out of nowhere. And she she looks at it and she goes, it's the Enterprise, you know, drop mouth drops to floor. Right. I wonder if we'll see that again right at the end. Just the Enterprise. We don't see who the captain is. is although we, I think we yeah. have a good idea. You think that would be too much or is that something you'd want to see? Oh, that would be amazing to have that show up there. Yeah, there could be a lot of trouble and maybe they make it to Planet Jenny. 
Right. And then they get surrounded by a bunch of snakeheads and birds of prey. And then all of a sudden, right as the, they're about to roll the, the credits, I'll say it, Captain Worf shows up with the Enterprise. <laughs> Yes. That would be cool. Yes. That would be cool. He'd have his beard braided, you know, it'd be like all gray and stuff. Yeah. And he's gonna... <laughs> That would be so awesome. Yes, it would. Today, maybe today is a good day to die. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard a thing about him being in the series no, at all. So I hope I hope it's a well-kept secret. Oh, yeah. That would be amazing. If you're a fanboy like ourselves, like us. Yeah. that would be, yes, that would be great. It might be a little over the top, but who wouldn't want to see that? Yeah, we've seen it a couple of times in the movies. Let's see it again. <laughs> yeah, really. Nothing wrong with the Calvary showing up. Nope. So once again, our friend Fred from the Netherlands has provided us some feedback. So let's take a listen. Hello, Steve and Dave. This is Fred from the Netherlands with some feedback for Star Trek Picard Season 1, Episode 7. I want to shout, rape, rape, mental rape. This all really violated, I think, Dr. Jurati. I don't understand why Agnes is such an uncertain person, so jittery and... Oh, yeah, uh, Commander O. Of course, she is intimidating, but nevertheless, Agnes is a director of a research program. She is just so, oh, am I in trouble, etc., etc. I, I don't find it fitting. Or it's just her character that she is like this. On the other hand, she kills Maddox, and you have to be brave to do something like that. So, I find that a little inconsistent. On the other hand, brave is perhaps not the right word, because she also could be desperate, if you see what she sees here during this mind melt. Next question is, where do these images come from? Is that just images in O's sick imagination? Or are it things that have happened, and she is a kind of time traveler, trying to prevent these things to happen? What are the things I liked in this episode? Well, to start with, actually, Lulu Wilson, the girl that plays Kestra. I didn't recognize her first, but she is playing young Shirley in The Hunting of Hill House, which I watched very thoroughly because I gave feedback for a podcast about that show. When she filmed this role as Kestra in Star Trek Picard, she was, I think, 14. She still is at the moment. And she does an amazing acting, I think. Almost as good, or perhaps even as good, as Millie Bobby Brown in Stranger Things, which also was very, very amazing at that age. But I think that was a little younger. But nevertheless, her interaction with Soji was very, very nice. And I think in this Troy... Riker family, there are some people who can really tell the truth. Diana, as well as Will, as well as this Kestra. They both did a good job, Diana and Will, in getting Picard more or less understand in which position he is with this young girl, Soji. Very nice that we get the head tilt even mentioned here. Will is not a dumb guy and gets everything right here. I really wonder if we will see them back in this season or perhaps even in the next season. Awful, of course, that Nerissa killed you. He became such a nice and loving person, as you see when he greets, for instance, Picard and what he does for Picard. But the badassness of Nerissa is top shelf. Okay, many more topics to discuss, but time's more or less up. Great, till next time, Fred from the Netherlands. Well, thanks so much for your feedback, Fred. Yeah, we kind of touched on a lot of those questions that you had uh, regarding O and where did she get it and how did she do it and where is she from? And <laughs> they're unknown questions, but we have some theories at least. Yeah. Hopefully, maybe you'll uh, like one of them. Maybe we'll play some Super Tramp uh, later on for the logical song. We'll find out why. Uh, find out why she thinks it's logical to be a traitor. Exactly. And what if yeah, she'll get her to? <laughs> and yeah, we both thought that Lulu Wilson did it a great job as Kestra, mm -hmm. and definitely had traits of both Will and Deanna, and showed just how smart she is. So yeah, they've got can only imagine how smart Thaddeus was would have turned out yeah got some brilliant minds there and kindred souls so that yeah, was nice that they were able to give 
Picard a break and still be able to impart some wisdom to him about dealing yeah. with the teenager. <laughs> right. Give him an example of what it's like to be a parent. Yes. <laughs> like this, Joe Luke, like this. See? Yeah. And yes, it was very sad that Nerissa was able to get Hugh, but I yeah. kind of have a feeling that Elnor might get some revenge before this season is over. Well, let's hope. Let's hope. I want a, a high noon on a board cube. Yes. <laughs> versus those two. I, I don't know what Seven of Nine is going to do, other than save the day. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, she's going to be kick-ass, but uh, I, I want some good fights. Yep. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on each and every episode this season, and we're looking forward to interacting with you on social media. So how can the fans interact with us, Dave? You can go to www.fangirlzone.com and click on the contact link. And there you'll find several ways to contact via email or social media. Steve's at at Sawyer Steve, and I'm at the real ID Dave. And please rate and review us on iTunes and every other platform you're using to get your podcast, as good ratings and reviews help other fans of the show find us, as there are a lot of Star Trek Picard podcasts out there. Tell your friends, and we do hope you're enjoying our podcast, and don't forget to check out the other great Fangirl Zone podcasts. The next episode is on March 12th and is titled Broken Pieces. So until then, remember... This is Chief Engineer Steve. So, you want to be ass deep in Romulans for the rest of your life? And this is Redshirt Dave. That doesn't sound like fun, Steve. No. <laughs> this is Redshirt Dave, and I'm going to Planet Ravi, where the currency is chocolate milk. Who could argue with that?